there we go. Hi, Neil. I see Neil there too as well. We'll have you be featured as the speaker in speaker of you as we, we get there. Um, but thank you everybody for, for coming in. We're going to continue with marketing research today. And we are lucky to have our guest, uh, Neil Schwartz here, who runs SBRNet, which is a database that we subscribe to through the library. Um, it is an excellent uh, resource for us and sometimes underutilized, I think. And that's one of the reasons I have uh, Neil here to talk about it. Plus, we're going to be using the database uh, two ways. First, for a in-class um, in class work that we'll be doing, a, a, a kind of a worksheet that we'll be, we'll, doing, we'll be doing. And then also you'll be using it for your marketing plan. So um, we'll, you'll, you'll, you'll at least have to access it twice. And so um, with that, I'm going to have Neil, Neil talk a little bit. And then when Neil's done talking, we're going to continue on a little bit with the lecture on market segmentation. If you remember last week, we had gone through demographics and then I started to um, talk about infographics. And so with that, or I'm, I'm sorry, not infographics, psychographics, maybe I am sick. If I can't talk, talk straight. Um, but we'll get into psychographics as well as some other ways that we segment customers. Um, just a little house cleaning before I, I have Neil take over is that we still will have our case study. So we have the research case study on Thursday. Remember that's based on the consumer behavior uh, science podcasts where you got to choose the podcast episode and then you're going to be analyzing that. Um, so we'll start with that in class on Thursday. It won't take, um, it'll take probably about half of half of the time um, for us to go through that. And then we will um, uh, then focus a little bit more on target marketing. So um, with that, I'm going to introduce Neil. So Neil, if we're, if we're in speaker view, um, I'm going to go into speaker view. I'm going to go into multi-speaker view um, there. But Neil, I'm gonna let you take it away. Uh, I, I know Neil for boy, how long now? I, it's it's, it was, it's been a long time. It's, it's probably while. close to um, close to ten over ten years for sure, at, at least. And I remember coming down to Fort Lauderdale to visit you and talk about marketing research, and that was really great to learn more about what you did when you were working for Sport Marketing Surveys at the time. So. Um, yes. With that, I'll let you go ahead and take over. And thank you for, for being here. Uh, Neil's going to talk a little bit about why research is important. And then he'll get a little bit more specific with um, SBRNet and how we can take advantage of using it. So go for yes. it. So, uh, Professor John, I want to thank you for inviting me in today. I'm sorry you're not feeling well. Can everybody hear me okay? Maybe just get a nod from somebody just so I can. Okay, good. Um so, uh, again, I appreciate you uh, coming all on Zoom today. Um, you know, I love doing these sessions. As Professor Casper said, I do love talking. I do love talking about sports. What I really love about sports is talking about data. Uh, you know, I'm a huge believer in that data driven process. And, and really, what that means is using facts, um, you know, from a variety of different sources, I might add to be able to make a specific case or make a specific, you know, answer a specific problem or overcome a specific challenge. Um, I've, I've always found that data gives me a little bit of a leg up. Um, so what we're going to try to do today is we're going to try to divide the day up into like four sections, as Professor Casper mentioned. Number one, I'm talking a little bit about SBRNet and me. Uh, can't always forget about talking about me. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about the process of using data. And I spoke to Professor Casper earlier in the week. He talked to me a little bit about what he was doing in the way of segmentation and things like that. So I kind of said, okay, let's do this. Since North Carolina State, of course, famous, great college basketball team, um, you know, let's maybe focus our attention on college basketball. And then let's even narrow it down a little bit more and focus specifically on one area. In this case, the area we're gonna focus on is sports gambling. And the reason why, it's just, it's a lot of fun. It's a fun topic to talk about. It's by the way, a great potential job opportunity for any of you when you get out of school. Um, all of the sports gambling sites and services are in fact hiring tons of people right now. And if you have, experience with data, 
that will give you a significant leg up over those that do not. Data is a wonderful tool. And the more you're comfortable with it, the more you're able to use it, the more you're able to integrate it. But, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask, and I know that Professor Casper has done, you've done some things in the methodology area, I, I guess, either previously or, you know, maybe even in this class. How many of you know the difference between qualitative and quantitative data or research, just out of curiosity, just by show of hands? I promise I'm not calling on anybody, but I, I may. So, you know what? I lied. Joey F., I am going to call on you. I see you right in the middle of my screen. Tell me the difference between qualitative and quantitative uh, data, just out of curiosity. Uh, quantitative is more like numerical data, like introducing to like numbers and stuff, while qualitative is more like behavioral data, like demographic stuff. Well, actually, um, demographics can fit into the quantitative data too, I might add, but you were essentially right. Quantitative, quantitative data is always numerically and it's always factually based. Qualitative data doesn't have to be, let's say, um, based in fact necessarily. It can be like, oh, you know, my gut tells me, or I heard from X who said this. Now, I like to laugh when I hear people say that because I like to say to them, you know, that is also known as anecdotal data. But Dr. Casper talked a little bit about, used a word that I do not use. It is completely out of my vocabulary. And that is the word is psychographics. That to me, you know, sounds like something the, F, uh, the CIA would use. No, I'm more into the quantitative side, actual numerical. Qualitative though, usually is used to describe why somebody does something. What's the reason behind your decision to root for the North Carolina State uh, Wolfpack? And, and we can talk a little bit about that as we go. So what I'm going to do is I'd like to talk a little bit about SBRnet. I'll touch on me real quickly. Um, but I'm going to share my screen right now. Thanks a lot, Joey, for the response, by the way. So let's do it this way. Hopefully it'll be okay. Can everybody see my screen that says SBR net gets you in the game? Awesome. That's always a good start. Dr. Casper, how long do I have today? Just so I know uh, how, how much or how little I need to talk. Uh, if you can go I, for about 45 minutes, 45 minutes or less. Oh, dude, I could do that standing on my head. I can. I, even know, do that I, I know you can do more. I know <laughs> you can do more. <laughs> 40, 45 is fine. Okay. So, you know, what I'd also like to do is, is as if you have a question, um, don't be afraid to ask the question. Put it in the chat. Okay. Um, I'm not going to, I won't, I promise not to embarrass anybody. I promise not to, you know, if you have a question though, I mean, Questions are really important because questions are how you learn. And by the way, questions are also how you challenge me because I might say something that doesn't make sense, happens, or something that you don't think is accurate, happens. Don't be afraid to challenge me. Put something in the chat and, and we'll go on. So let me talk a little bit about my company, SBRnet. It's a great service. Um, I've owned SBRnet for about five years. We are focused on providing data for the business of sports. I love sports. I will tell you. Um, you're going to get a lot of energy out of me, a lot of enthusiasm, and it's 100% sincere. Why? I love sports. Sports are fun. Let's face it. If you can't have fun talking about sports, my recommendation is go find something else to, to do. You know, go go find another vocation because sports are so much fun and i know as dr casper can tell you because he's been involved also in so many different aspects of sports right now in fact i know he's going to become the uh pickleball king um, as i remember correctly uh, and we can talk a little bit about that too as we go on but just to let you know about me i've actually been in marketing research for over 25 years of which 20 has been focused on sports so whether it's focused on sports equipment, sports participation, sports fans, you know, whatever it is focused on the world of sports, I have been involved in it. And I've been lucky. I've been lucky enough to work with some of the greatest brands. 
brands like Under Armour, Nike, Adidas, um, you know, brands that you might wear, you know, you might be wearing right now uh, and brands that you might also prefer right now. I've had the opportunity to work with some of the great, great leagues and teams. I've worked with Major League Baseball, the NFL, the NHL. Um, done some work down here in Miami with uh, Inter Miami, the new, you know the MLS team. So what's cool about sports for me is I get to talk about different sports and different things all the time. But again, I love talking about sports. I love talking about data. So data about sports, win win for me. Oops, I want to go to the next page here. There we go. So SBRnet is a wonderful service that you're going to use. Number one, it is one of the largest consumer studies that's done every year focused on sports fans. And we cover 19 separate sports. So, of course, all the biggies, the NFL, the NHL, the NBA. But we cover all the littleies, too. We cover minor league baseball, minor league hockey, tennis, golf, auto racing, how many of you are fans of auto racing? Just out of curiosity, I mean, uh, how many of you are fans of Formula One or have become fans of Formula One recently? I'm going to raise my hand. Before I watched Drive, Drive to Survive on Netflix, I couldn't have given a rat's butt about Formula One. Now, I watch the every season and every Sunday when there's a race, I go on YouTube to check the eight-minute highlights or the 10-minute highlights of the race. So I've become a fan of Formula One. None of you here are fans of Formula One, just out of curiosity? Okay. All right. I, How I'm many of you watch the drive? drive to Survive? Try to Survive made me watch it more, but I still don't don't have the really? has anybody watched Drive more. to Survive just out of curiosity? It's been a great show. It's really helped it. Um have many of you watched the show on uh golf, I think it's called what's it called? I forget now. They did a golf one. Um, oh crap! I forgot the name. Have any are any of you have any of you watched golf? You know, since watching any of the shows that are on Netflix or any of the other um, shows that are out there. Okay, just out of curiosity. Oh, Full Swing. Thank you, Jake. I appreciate that. Have any of you watched Full Swing? I have to admit, I watched it too. I'm a huge golf fan in general. So, I mean, for me, it was great. But the point is that SBRnet will help you understand what it means to be a sports fan. Hey, you can be a sports fan, but you can also have a number of attributes, a number of behaviors, a number of things that make you a better sports fan. As an example, I'm a fan of the Miami Dolphins. I am. Now, am I a better fan? I watch all the games on TV from the comfort of my own couch. I'll go to one game a year because one of my friends has season tickets and uh, I'll glom free tickets off of him. But am I a better fan than, let's say, somebody who goes to games, travels to watch the Dolphins, buys licensed, mm, buys licensed merchandise for the Dolphins, which I almost did yesterday, gambles on the Dolphins, um, maybe drafts Dolphin players on their fantasy team if they play fantasy, do we help measure what level of fandom and, and the different attributes that go into that level of fandom? And we do it every year via a rather large consumer study. The study is done every year, first quarter. We survey over 6,000 sports fans, ages 13 years and above, to get their specific habits and behaviors when it comes to their sports fandom, you know, activities or how they look at sports fandom. So I, I know who's fan of North Carolina State basketball. I know who's fans of the Miami Dolphins. I mean, I don't know personally because we don't collect any personal information. That, of course, would be illegal and violate privacy laws, which we do not do. It's all collected what they call anonymously or fully anonymized. So again, proprietary study of sports been done since 2017. At least I've done it since 2017. Conducted in Q1, always looking back, trailing 12-month period. Utilizes a sample size of 6,500 or more. This year it was 6,600 or more. Um, we use internet sampling methodology. 
Do everybody understand what that is? Have many of you taken surveys on the internet or gotten an invite to take a survey on the internet? Most of the students I have see, taken a class that covers surveys a little okay. bit. I see David, Davidson kind of nodding his head up and down over in the corner. So you have you done an online survey uh, recently, Static Curiosity? Uh, not recently, but I've, I've done one. What did you find about them? Did you, did you like doing them? You didn't like doing them? Did you did you just uh, go ahead and just check off whatever you think the people want to hear? Or, you know, were you honest with yourself? Uh, I usually just get it done as fast as possible. Just you know, I <laughs> prefer when they don't ask for a short answer. And I just get to click yes or no. And five yeah. minutes tops I, is my most, the most I'm <laughs> I mean, personally, I don't like it when it goes over 10 minutes, which is kind of ironic because our survey, the one that we do, we're looking at over 15 minutes, what they call on survey or on, you know, on, yeah, 15 minutes on survey. That's a long time, by the way. Um, but our collection is based on the U.S. population. All the numbers we're going to show you have been what they call weighted up to reflect the total U.S. population for persons 13 years and older to approximately 278 million people here in the United States. Um, the data that we collect is also what they call a quota-based or balanced sample. And we use age, income, gender, household size, geography, race, and ethnicity as a way to create our sample. It's almost like building a bridge. When you build a bridge, what do they do first? They build a model of the bridge because they want to test the, the model against outside forces or against the, that's what I do. I build a model of the United States and then I use that data to scale it up or weight it up. So it gives you a really good, really accurate um, and real well-defined. It's also what they call a single source collection. I don't bring in data from any outside sources whatsoever. So it's all what they call single source us. So one of the things I want to do is that when you're doing a project, like I know what you're working on with Dr. Casper, you know, when you're doing a marketing class, when you're looking at segmentation, when you're looking to overcome a challenge or overcome a situation, it's always about answering the tough questions. And the tough questions always start with these six words. Who, what, when, where, why, and the tough one, how. Although why is actually the real tough one. But it's who, what, when, where, why, and how. When you're thinking about your segmentation project, when you're thinking about the demographics that you're going to select or the target market that you want to profile, you want to think in the context of who are they? What do they do? When do they do it? Where do they do it? I'm going to go jump on to how. How do they do it? And then the why part could be a little bit more, let's say, warm and fuzzy. But everything else is 100% quantitative, numerically and factually based. Very important that you separate, you know, numerical, factual, quantitative from qualitative. Who can give me, I'm going to call on somebody again. So uh, let's see here. Who's my looking at? Uh, Stephen Marcy down in my left corner there. Give me a factually based statement. Did you watch any football games this weekend, Stephen? I did. Give me one factually based statement from any one of the football games that you watched this weekend. Um, 49ers beat the Jets. Well, that's true, but how about the the quantitative? What was the score? Uh, it was like twenty nine to fourteen or something. Right. So yes, the 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 fact is that they did beat them, but the quantitative aspect tells you more of the story. What the final score was. Who here watched a college football game this weekend? Joey, that's a, that's a sensitive topic for us. This week. Why North Carolina? Oh, yeah, so why is why are you saying that, uh, Dr. Casper? We played Tennessee but lost pretty bad, so it was not this we, we were, we were so hoping, you guys you, you know. guys were kind of the sacrificial lamb for this week. Uh, not, uh, not a sacrificial lamb, but um because there was some there we were wanted, some teams we, that were 
really sacrificed to the, you know, to uh, the college football gods this weekend. We're, 20, we're I mean, 24 I, in the country. We just didn't play that. Uh, I feel bad, felt bad for some of the teams like Temple that had to go play at Oklahoma. I think the final score was like 76 to 10 or some ridiculous score like that. Hannah, I see you up there in the corner. What's your hat say, by the way? Um, I don't even know what it says, actually. I it's can't see brand. it. <laughs> Give me a qualitative statement about one college football game that you saw this weekend. Um, well, I went to the NC State game. So what, what happened there? What did you see there that wasn't factually based, but maybe observationally based? Um, uh, Tennessee definitely outplayed us in the that's, second that, half. That's fine. That's fine. I was going to say, hey, how did the North Carolina State Wolfpack fans react to the? Were they into it? Were they kind of apathetic? You know, were they just there to party? Well, you know, that's what I would have focused on. But what you said is just fine. That was actually a great answer. So uh, no problem there. So again, everything that you're doing, quantitative, qualitative, factually based is always first. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. So what are we going to do today? We're going to do a specific project today. So I spoke to Dr. Casper Monday. I guess that was yesterday. And we had a little talk. And we talked, look, North Carolina State, you know, I would say you guys are royalty when it comes to college basketball. I am, I am a huge college basketball fan. I remember, of course, way back into the Michael, you know, back into the, um, what do you call it, the David Thompson days, of way before your time. I remember the Jim Valvano days, well before your time. So I can remember back into, you know, I I, I have to admit I've been, uh, oh, somebody needs to get admitted there, Dr. Uh, oh, you got it? Okay, good. So today, when you're doing your projects, it's always about identifying the topic, but then what it is you want to accomplish. So today we're going to use a little example and I'm going to get to the data of the site and all that, all that other good stuff. But we're going to talk about college basketball fans and we're going to identify some benchmarks. In this case, we're going to use gambling benchmarks. We're going to select some groups to compare to the benchmark. Now, I always believe that the most effective way to use data is to compare data to the benchmark. Compare what you're looking at to what other people are doing. To me, that is the single most important thing that you can do with data. Compare your target groups to your benchmarks. Do they underperform or overperform the benchmarks? In some cases, overperforming is good, underperforming is bad. In other cases, underperforming is good. I know that's a weird idea, but I'll explain that to you a little bit as we go on. Narrow down your selected target group, age, demographics, um, income, ethnicity, marital status, and then geography. There's always a lot of things you can do to do in this case. And then in this case, we're going to talk about gambling on sports. Now, I don't know any of your parents. I don't know how many of you, by raise of hand, and I swear I don't know anybody, how many of you have gambled on a sporting event? Me too. How many of you do the annual, like a, um, do a uh, pool for the NCAA tournament, you know, the bracket pool? Guess what? That's gambling. <laughs> <laughs> but I do it too. And you know what? It's a lot of fun. People love to gamble on sports. And I know in North Carolina, gambling on sports is, in fact, legal. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of where we're at. So we're going to talk about gambling on college basketball specifically. We're going to – remember what I said, compare and benchmark. Or benchmark and compare. We're going to compare North Carolina State fans that gamble on sports versus the average college basketball fan who gambles on sports – and then we're going to build a target profile. Who do we want to go after? You know, do we want to look at those that are gambling? Or I actually picked out an interesting data point. 
those fans at North Carolina State that say they're going to gamble more next year than they did last year. Now, that's an interesting number because that's a chance for you to be a little predictive and try to look ahead. So I'm going to, just real quick, I'm going to promote myself real quickly. Um, you know, look, follow us on LinkedIn, follow us on Twitter, now called X, Instagram. I need the love. You know, if you can follow us, that is awesome. Again, my name's Neil Schwartz. If you have any questions about anything, you know, if you want to funnel it through Dr. Casper, that's great. And if not, you can send them right to me. He'll, Dr. Casper, I'll, I'll tell you, and we'll tell you that I am pretty good about responding. Can you all see my website? Do I get, I get a nod or anything? From my own? Okay. So you have access to the website via your library. I do not know the exact link that you have to go to. Neil, let me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna make sure they know that. But just so you guys know, this is not something you can just Google. You actually have to go through our library, and then in the search term, just put in FBRnet, and then it'll come up with the with the link. But you have to link to it through the library and use your Unity ID. Otherwise, you can't get it. So that's a common question when we do our assignments. Is I can't find the data. It says I have to pay for it, and it's because you haven't gone through the library. So you need to make sure that you do go through the library for it. Yes. And also, one, do not use your phones. It does not, I have, the site is not fully optimized for phone usage. It is optimized for laptop, obviously desktop, as well as even a, a tablet. But do not use your phones. It will be a problem. But as Dr. Casper said, you can't go in and just Google uh, SBRnet and then go in that way. You will not get in. It'll ask you to pay for it. And the school has already taken care of that for you. So you go in through the school library. So there's a number of things I want to show, but mostly I'm going to start with the data side of things. So since we're talking about college basketball, so this is SBRnet. We've got a lot of great things to look at. I'm going to take you back here towards the end of the presentation. Let's see. Ooh, I'm kind of running a little behind here. But the one area that's really important and a great place to start is up here at the top where it says summaries. And over here, it says single sport summaries. And here is where you're able to get at what we call summary level or 30,000 foot level data of one of the sports that we measure. By the way, here's all 19. But let's go to college basketball. Now, I can tell you, honestly, I don't personally use this data per a lot. You know what I use this for? I use this just to get kind of get the lay of the land, to got to get a little bit of an understanding. You know, is college basketball growing? The answer is since 2016, it's growing a lot. Since 2022, it's growing a lot. Now, all of the raw num all of the data, all the whole numbers, excuse me, are listed in thousands. So that number underneath 2023 is not 91,000. That's 91 million. College basketball has 91,528,000 fans here in the United States, ages 13 and above. We then get, you can then go down and look at, you know, how they're watching, how many people go, um, how many people have attended. There's just a number of different ways, a number of different 30,000 foot view things that you can look at. I just use this as a way to get an idea if a sport's growing or not. What I like to do a lot of times is I'll compare, let's say this sport, let's say I'll, I'll compare this versus let's say college, um, college football. Just out of curiosity, college football has actually grown more. They've went from 109 million 586,000 fans in 2022 to 122 million 413 419,000 fans. By the way, college basketball football, my bad, is the number two sport when it comes to total fans. It's not, you know, it ranks differently when we look at gambling, when we look at other things. But again, it gives you a chance to compare and understand what's going on with a specific sport. And you know what? Look, you can export this data to Excel. 
It drops into a, an Excel spreadsheet right away. Easy to work with, easy to use. But this isn't really where I'm going to recommend that you go. When you're ready to start doing your project, I'm going to recommend to you, you go to our premium section. Luckily, the folks at North Carolina State, also thanks to Dr. Casper, have agreed to upgrade and get our, what we call our fan level detail. So this is the first place you go to premium, you go to fan studies, and unbelievable, look at all this data that comes up all the way back to 2017. Now, guess what? I do not expect you to go all the way back to 2017. Just don't. But the college basketball fan study 2023 listed right here. You would click on it. It would download. And then it would come up and look like this. At least I hope. Da -da. Did the Excel spreadsheet come up? Thank you, Dr. Casper. So what are we looking at here? I'm going to go backwards a little bit just to go back. Hang on for a second. So first of all, it's always important that you make yourself comfortable or at least understand the methodology. I can tell you honestly, I have more meetings have gone completely south when somebody around the room says to the person presenting, hey, where'd you get this data? And they can't answer. That is the kiss of death. When Dr. Ka when you're doing your presentations with Dr. Casper, or you're making your, and he asks you, where does this data come from? Better know, better understand it. You don't need to be an expert. That's my job. But you do need to understand it. It's based off of consumer survey, was done in the first quarter, 6,666 respondents um, of, of, of sports fans, ages 13 and above here in the United States. It's all in domestic USA. If you want to get into some of the finer points of it, that's fine. But those four points can get you through, hey, where did this data come from? Okay. The next tab over, by the way, is content. Contents. This is our total table of contents for all of the things that we measure on SBRnet. Remember I said 65 categories of data? It's unbelievable how much is here. Now, in some cases, what we've done, we've done a, some of the work for you. And I'll show you that in a minute. But again, we everything from attended and watched, social media, demographics, streaming, um, spending. And then, of course, today we're going to talk about sports gambling. That's what we decided to settle on. Now, let's talk a little bit. I went right to the sports gambling tab. Is everybody able to see this chart that I have on screen right now? We can see it. It's a little bit small to see if you can. I'll make, make it bigger. I'll better. make it bigger. I'll make it bigger. I can do that. Is that bigger? Is that better? Or do we need to make it even bigger? No, that's good. I, at least for me, that's okay. Okay. So... This is what we're doing here. Oh, let me go. I actually went too far. So we're looking at college basketball. What do we know? Well, we know there's 91,528,000 fans, um, college basketball fans that gambled on sports, at any sport in the last 12 months. You know what? I wrote that number down because I felt that it was an important number for me to grab. Interestingly enough, that's 22.9% right underneath it, or 23%. So 23% of all college basketball fans have gambled on some sports. I would write that number down. You don't have to do anything more than write it down on a piece of paper. But what I also did was I went down here to the down line 58. And I wanted to find out what do those numbers look like for people who gambled just on college basketball. I need a drink. So there's that 91,528,000 number again. 
total people who gambled on basketball, college basketball, of which we know 9.4 million nationwide are 10.3% gambled specifically on college basketball. I would write that number down. So 10.3% of college basketball fans gambled on college basketball. That's an important number to write down because what are we going to end up doing? We're going to benchmark NC State fans against the national number. Are NC State fans more or less likely to be gambling on college basketball? Hey, Zach Robinson, I see you sitting there. Just do you think NC State fans gamble more or less than the average? I would say... You're making a guess, so don't worry if it's right or wrong. I would say probably less. You actually, you're going to find out that you were actually on target here. So let's talk about it as we go a little bit more. So again, oh, here's what's important also. If you look at those who Gabe said yes nationally, as you go across the chart, we list all of the various demographic and other Remember I told you earlier, we've done a lot of the cross tabs for you. Well, we know, in fact, that 13.9% of male college basketball fans gamble on college basketball, only 4% women. Is that, a, is that a challenge? Is that an opportunity? Or is that a challenge? Uh, Tylene, what do you think? Do you, do you think that's an opportunity or a challenge? Um. Maybe a challenge because, like, maybe you're right. It's a big challenge because it shows right away that women just really aren't interested that much in gambling on college basketball. But here you get to go across and look at all of the other demographics that we collect, whether it's ethnicity, whether it's age, or one of my favorites is generational information. Can everybody see this? Okay, I love. Whoops. My bad. I love working in the generational stuff because, you know, it's easy to talk about age things and all that, but I love, love, love talking about uh, the, the genera um, generational stuff. Here's what's interesting to me. The largest single cell or percentage of fans are, in fact, Gen X or 43 to 58. But look at the boomers. They are the least likely to be gambling on college basketball. I'm a boomer. Um, I think, Dr. Casper, you're probably a Gen Xer. What do you, you're, so I knew that. So you're an Xer, and then below you, of course, the millennia, uh, millennials. Probably a lot of your brothers and sisters are millennials. And then, of course, you guys are Gen Xers. And you know what? Your numbers are pretty good in terms of the percentage of Gen Xers, Gen Zs, I'm sorry, that are, in fact, gambling on college basketball. But again, the data has already been run for you. Don't try to remake the data. It's already done. It gives you the region of the country. It gives you, you know, even if they bought merch, you know, they bought t-shirts or hats, how many games they attended. You know, what's interesting is that, and this might not be a surprise, although it is to me, that people that attended two to four college basketball games a year actually gamble at a higher percentage than those that go to five or more games. That surprises me a little bit because, you know, you would think that somebody that goes to five or more games would probably want to gamble more. But again, it gives you the opportunity, you know, I don't know if in your presentations you're going to have to talk about social media. But it's always a good idea to know what social media platforms sports gamblers are using. But again, all of this data is all right here in one place. You don't need to run the cross tabs. All you need are pick out a few data points that you like. Remember what I said earlier, 10.3% of all college basketball fans bet on college basketball. Somebody write that number down for me in case I forget it. But now what we're going to do is we're going to start narrowing our focus. We're going to stop looking at just 
college basketball fans. And where we're going to go is here. We're going to go back to the premium data. And you're going to go to the second, what I call the second checkerboard, where it says premium fan studies team by team. Right here is where you get access to all the team data. And we, of course, have college basketball. And I, of course, have already run it. And it's up here. Let me know when you can all. I'm going to make it bigger because I, apparently I didn't make it bigger last time. Is that a little better? Yeah, can everybody that's, see that? Somebody give me. Good. Is that good, Dr. Casper? Thank you. Yeah. So what did I do? I, 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 I skipped ahead a little bit. So here's what I did. I want to compare. I want to determine if North Carolina State fans, basketball fans, are in fact a good target for um, approved and licensed gambling platforms. Do they gamble more or less? What's the opportunity look like? And then who are they? So let's start off by first thing. We know that according to our data, that there are 1.1 million fans of North Carolina, actually it's almost 1.2 million if you want to round up, nationally. That's a good number, by the way. I mean, it's not Ohio State numbers. It's not, you know, it's not some of the bigger school numbers, but the North Carolina State numbers are good. There's one point, let's call it 1.2 million between you and me. But what do we know? We know that 10.7% of North Carolina State fans have gambled on any sport. Does anybody remember that number that I quoted way back a few minutes ago when we looked at kind of the global amount of uh, total gambling? Does anybody remember? How about you, Jenna? Any chance you remember that number? Was it 10.3? Hold on to that number. That's a good number. We're going to need that one. But the number I wanted to look at was that 20, um, 29% of all um, – 29 percent of all – College football, uh, college basketball fans gambled on any sport, but only 10.7% of NC State fans gambled on any sport. So, you know, you may look at that and say, well, maybe North Carolina State fans are just not that into sports gambling. So let's do this. Let's go down and take a look at gambled or placed bets on college basketball in the last 12 months. Again, there's that 1.2 million, but there's that 7.2 number. So, Jenna, what was that number you just quoted back at me? 10.3. So 10.3% of all college basketball fans gambled on college basketball, but only 7.2% of NC State fans gamble on college basketball. If you were going to do a presentation to one of, let's say, the big, you know, DraftKings or one of Bet MGM, Jackson Gill, do you think that North Carolina State basketball fans make for a good target audience when it comes to gambling on sports? I would say yeah. I would actually probably say no because they're underperforming the national average. Remember earlier we talked about benchmarking? You know, when you're close in benchmarking, you know, that's where you can really, you know, kind of say, okay, and all that. But when you're this far off, you know, you're literally 30% less than the national average. You know what? If I was a sports gambling company, I might find a better school. You know, I might want to go after Ohio State fans, 13%. I might want to go after – let's find a good number here. Hey, Neil, I wonder if some of it is the fact that we didn't have legal gambling until this year. Do you think that was captured in the data or not? Well, it probably is not. But I will tell you there's kind of good news here. And let me tell you where it was. We measure in line 2210, we ask a question about – spending more or less. And I took a look at that data and I said, okay, again, I wanted to see if North Carolina state fans 
are going to be spending. Let me go back to my North Carolina state number. So what do we see here? We see here that 43.8% though of North Carolina state fans say they're going to spend more on sports gambling this year. Jackson, that probably turns around that no answer to yes. Because, look, there's only three ways that a gambling company grows. One, they bring in more customers. Two, they do they get a bigger what they call handle from the existing customer base. So in the case of North Carolina State fans, they would be able to generate a lot more money. In fact, if you look as an example, Ohio State, 25.4% of Ohio State fans say they're going to gamble more, 43.8% of North Carolina state fans. You know, I would look at that and be able to make a good positive case for that particular thing. But then what I would go back and look at, and I'm going to go back to the very beginning here is, who are North Carolina state fans? And again, I would go right here to be attended and watched. And I would start to look at comparing Certain data points, let's say, for North Carolina State against other aspects of college. You know, do they attend more or less games? You know, do they tend to skew? Do they tend to stream more or less? Are they younger or older? Do, uh, do they have a higher percentage who plan to attend a college basketball game? So, again... You want to start looking at those attributes. Remember, we want to answer who, what, when, where, why, tough one, and how. So, again, we want to be able to answer the tough questions. I, look, I know I'm probably running going to run over time. Uh, Dr. Castro, I have a couple more things not data-related to talk about the show. And then um, I think there's a couple questions here in the chat box. Uh, Broncos stink. That was pretty funny, by the way. Wow, uh, that was yeah. That, it was just me. Was that, that was Dr. my fact. That was my quantitative fact. I love it. Uh, and the Skywalker quote, I don't get it. Oh, that's uh, Thompson, uh, David Thompson, Skywalker. Uh, uh, that, uh, was his, that was that was yes. Yeah. Uh, do, you but, remember, okay. do you remember David Thompson, uh, Doctor Thompson? He was a Denver Nugget too. Okay. Um. So keep, let's try I'm and sorry. keep it to about ten minutes, if you don't mind. You I got know? it. I got it. So. There's a lot of things that you can do on the SBR Next site. One of the things I recommend is when you're doing a project, always start up here in the upper right-hand corner, and it's our little search area. What we've done is that I have a group of analysts who every day are looking through various publications to be able to look at, to understand what's going on you know, in the individual sports. It saves you a little bit of Google time or a little bit of chat GPT time, because it focuses you right on the subject matter. So if you're looking at college basketball, it'll take you right to what's going on, um, you know, as a result of, and, and by the way, there is a lot going on right now in college sports in general, to say yeah. the least. And let, let me just inter interrupt you really quick. And actually, as part of the assignment that we're going to be doing the in-class assignment they're going to be required to go above and beyond the data and use those, use those articles as a way to go above, above and beyond just the numbers. Good. Do any of you listen to any podcasts, any sports related podcasts? Anyone, anybody? If you're interested in getting a job in sports, I would highly suggest you pick out one or two of the podcasts listed here in the resource center under podcasts and check out one of these that might interest you, whether it's about gambling, whether it's about the NBA, whether it's about, you know, whatever it's about, I would suggest that you find yourself a podcast that interests you. There's about 200 listed here. So one of my favorites, by the way, is the Bill Simmons podcast, just because Bill tends to do a lot of non-sports related, more a lot of pop culture type of things, and I tend to enjoy that. And there's my podcast. My podcast is called My First Job in Sports, and I need to put the picture up for the latest edition. 
But if you're interested in getting a job in sports, one of the great ways to find out how to do that is to find out what other people did. How did they get a job? You know, what did they do? What did they do in terms of their, um, you know, networking, social media? What are the things that they did? So again, we provide you with a number of tools and resources. Here is a list of top people to follow on social media. Don't be afraid to pick out one or two of these people and follow them on Instagram, follow them on X, Twitter, whatever. I still call it Twitter. I'm, I can't give in to Elon Musk. That's a personal thing more than anything else. But, but again, we've, all, we've really got a lot of things. When you're ready to start looking for a job, use our directory over here in the Resource Center under directories of major sports executives. And here is where you can pick out, you know, executives from all the different teams and leagues get their email address, get their LinkedIn information website. We are always updating the information because let's face it, people change jobs kind of frequently. So again, this is a great tool to help you when the time comes to find a job. I'm going to stop right there. And I'm going to ask if there's any questions or anything anybody wants to ask me. Now's a good time. No, nobody? That'll be sad. It's got to give him a few seconds to think. All right. <laughs> I have a question for the whole group. How many of you are hoping to get a job in the sports business when you graduate school? In the sports business? I don't see a I lot think, of hands raised. I think most most are, or maybe they're just not, not, not okay. just raising their hands. I, I don't want to, like, scare you or anything like that, but when you're looking for a job, really go beyond, you know, you're not going to most likely get a job with, you know, um, the Carolina Panthers or, you know, the hurricane or not. You're not going to get, you know, you're going to get most likely you're going to find a job in something sports tourism, maybe working with a sports commission. You're going to find a job, maybe working even minor league baseball, minor league hockey, great places to start your career. Don't forget that, you know, you want to get that all important first job and you want to be able to use data when it's called for. No questions? I guess there's no questions, Any, Dr. Gaffney. Anybody? All right, here oh, we wait. got a couple or one. What is my educational background? Yeah, there you go. That's Luke. That from Luke, right? Turn it back so on Luke. him, Luke. Good job, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> so Luke my background is I, I went to uh I'm, I'm from Philadelphia originally I'm a huge Philadelphia fan but I have lived down here in, in Florida since 1992 I'm one of those guys that does root for the home team so I am a Dolphin Marlins I was a huge Panther fan I was a great season because they won the Stanley Cup but um you know my background in sports is probably not a whole lot that you know I just grew up around sports I played sports um, wasn't very good, but I loved sports. And I also loved data. Interestingly enough, I went to Syracuse University. I got my bachelor's degree at Syracuse. This is before they had the Falk School. Um, I went out and got a job out in Los Angeles. I got my MBA um, at UCLA while I was working. But when I got back from um, there and I came home to Philadelphia, I went to work for Comcast, the big cable company. And there is where I got exposed to using data and how valuable data can be because I was using data just from our subscriber lists. And then after that, I got a little bit more curious and a little bit more curious and a little bit more curious. Now, 30 years later, I own my own data company. I believe in the data-driven decision process. And I am like a, you know, I'm like an evangel, I'm like a warrior for using data and making sure the data is used properly. It has to be used right. If you use it wrong, there's nothing, you know, I, 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 I get a kick sometimes I'll be invited in to look at some presentations and somebody will get up and they'll, they'll say, oh, there's 96, you know, 96,000 fans of the uh, what NBA. It's a lot more than that, by the way. But I'll say, for, I'll, you know, I'll say, you know, do you do know that's 96 million, right? <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I do like to get involved in, you know, that, but, but look, turn your love of sports, turn your enjoyment of sports, 
turn the fun of sports into your career. And you know what? It'll never seem like a job. Every day, it never seems like a job to me. Never. I, I love every day of what I do. And I love the opportunity to talk to students like yourselves. I enjoy talking and spending time with Dr. Casper. You know what? It's a great business. I love the business of sports. Anything else? All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Neil. I really appreciate it. And hopefully everyone will appreciate the, the data that you provide us. That's something that's really valuable to us at, 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 in our program. If you have questions as you're working through your projects, you know, run them through Dr. Casper. And in most cases, he'll be able to answer them. But in a bunch of cases, if he's not, I'll be able to answer them. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a good day, everybody. All right. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Remember to follow us on social media.